Well, I'm also very happy to be here, so thank you for inviting me. And um, I think uh, 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 Todd's first lecture was just perfect for me because it gave exactly the background for the economic background, which I would have liked to add to my own presentation, but then I realized that we need two hours, so I, I deleted those slides. And what I will try to show today is that the uh, reality, if you look at the reality, reality behind all those economic assumptions and economic theories and so on, is very different. I mean, it, and one reason is, of course, that all the theories which are, even if they are, in a sense, uh, uh, reasonable in a certain di dimension, they are always based on assumptions. These assumptions are never tested empirically. And when you start trying to, to do it, you realize that uh, they are not there in the data and the consequences are very, very uh, uh, strong. I mean, it's not that it wouldn't mean anything if the consequences, the conclusions were, were robust, but they are not. And that is what I will try to convince you by showing, uh, by showing uh, data on how the empirical economy works and how it actually has been enormously impacted by uh, financial behavior. So uh, I'm uh, born Finn. I moved to Denmark in, in 66. And uh, I also speak Danish with a Scandinavian accent. But it's clearly easier for me to speak English in, professional, uh, 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 in a professional context. So um, I, I'm actually now retired. Uh, Emerita, that means that I'm still in working, but I'm not really teaching and, and supervising students, but I'm still doing a lot of, of research. Uh, I was a professor in econometrics, which means the mathematical statistical analysis of economic models. And uh, that empirical economics, of course, means that I have used the, these methods to uh, investigate the empirical reality. Uh, the major part of our research, it is actually together with my husband, he is a professor in mathematical statistics. Uh, that has been the analysis of, of non-stationary time series using the co-integrated VAR approach. And this certainly must sound like Latin to you. <laughs> and, and I will not try to actually really explain what it is about because it is quite complex. But it is a method which I think is tailor-made to analyze uh, economic models in the sense of not forcing the economic models on the data, but actually first analyzing uh, the, the models in a broad statistical uh, way so that we can test all assumptions that usually are assumed and, in, uh, and put onto the, the, the model instead of first testing them. So in a sense, I would say um, it is designed to let the reality speak as freely as possible about the, the empirical relevancy of the uh, theoretical models. And that is what I have been doing in, in more than, uh, say, 30, 40 years. I have, I'm probably the person who have analyzed most empirical applications in the world. <laughs> And that is, of course, together with students and colleagues and, and, and so on. And, uh, and uh, the question is then, what have the, the results shown? And it's clear, completely clear, that my mainstream macroeconomic theory models are based on assumptions which do not fit the data very well. That is absolute out of question. That is the, 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 the conclusion. And uh, the theory models, and now this comes a statistical concept, the theory models often assume stationarity. It means that things are somehow evolving in a very stable and, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, say, constant way. Katarina, can the participants have your slides afterwards? Yes, 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 fine, sure. Fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in a very stable and, and, and constant way. But uh, the 
economic data are clearly non-stationary. Non so in that sense, I mean, already when you estimate the, the ec economic model, you make an assumption which is not there in the data. And, uh, and one reason why the data are so uh, non-stationary, meaning, I mean, evolving over time, changing over time, and unpredictable over time, and so on, that is due to the financial sector. The effect of the financial sector is very much undervalued. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, that is, you know, when you include uh, the financial sector behavior into, as an explanatory variable into the economic model, things change in a very fundamental way. In Denmark, the, the, the absolutely most important date is the, uh, 1983. That was where the international capital uh, uh, movements were deregulated, and uh, it, was, uh, it was suddenly possible to move capital over the borders. Uh, before 83, because I came from Finland, and I had the need to, to move 50,000 kronos from Finland to to Denmark, and I had to first ask uh, the central bank, bank if, uh, uh, if, if I was allowed to do so. Now it's a no problem, and it has had an enormous impact on, on, on what happens. And you will see it in the data in a while. So uh, before 83, the financial sector was heavily regulated, and uh, when it was deregulated, it expanded very quickly, and it be became a very powerful actor in the society. You will see in the, f in the slides soon that the interest rate fell to a very low level, approximately from 22%. It's very hard to imagine anything like this today, but it was actually 22%. It fell to something like 10% very, very quickly, and then it continued to, to fall. And uh, that meant among other things, that it be became very easy and cheap for banks to borrow in international markets. And the consequence was then an enormous expansion of banks' loan capital. You can see this in the data, because before 83, there were basically two fundamental trends. We call it also the exogenous forces driving the, the, the economy. And they represented then a real and a nominal trend. You can think of it as a real trend, that is the productivity growth, the growing standard of living in the economy. The nominal trend is usually then meant the inflation rate, how the inflation rate evolves. After 83, we find a third trend, which is I would call, usually call a financial trend. And it became very quickly the dominant one, absolutely the most important one. And the economic structures then change very fundamentally. So how important was all this, the deregulation of it? The finance industry became ever more dominant in our society, and the reality became ever more unstable. And one could say that one consequence is that the inequality has been rising, has been growing, populism has increased almost everywhere, social unrest is now the new norm, climate crisis do not seem to be stoppable, we have politicians seem unable to decide about the necessary and, and radical measures. And that is because every time they, they try to do anything, the financial uh, sector is so much more powerful that they give up and they say, and we get what, what they call the, the, the uh, uh, necessary, the, uh, uh, have to, to avoid the, the, the uh, necessary uh, 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 solutions. So I think we need uh, to initiate a democratic discussion about the economic mechanisms in our society that I think against uh, uh, all reason continue to undermine 
the social cohesion. And a good, uh, good place to start is with the macro models because of the finance ministry, because they have an enormously uh, uh, an enormous power to decide. Because every political uh, decision has to go through the models of the finance ministry to check whether they are are good or or or, or, or what the economic implications of the political uh, uh, political. Uh, uh, suggestion the proposal is. And of course, uh, if these models do not really correspond to, to, to the true economic reality, I think it is a, a democratic problem. Because you very often will end up with, uh, yes, solutions which, uh, do not are, which are not optimal uh, in a de democratic sense. Yes, you had a question about the word deregulation. Yeah. Um, I think I read somewhere, maybe it was uh, Robert Rice, the former Minister of Labor in the Clinton government, uh, when he wrote about this issue about deregulation, he said, yeah, every time you hear the word deregulation, it, yes. it actually means regulation to the benefit of the biggest and the strongest players at the market. Is that something that you have? Yes. Uh, it, it actually, yeah, that was a, that was exactly what it meant. I mean, that was the, the, the consequence, yeah. because the financial sector has become an extra, extraordinary powerful agent, and every time they have deregulated, they have got more and more power. Yeah. So yes, I fully agree, and hope I will be able to convince you also. So. In the, re the rest of the talk, I will talk about bubbles, crises, imbalances, and, and how they are related to the financial sector. The growing inequality we have seen in, in our e economies, the, and the growing indebtedness and economic growth, if I have time for it. And then finally, I can, a few words about, about what we can do. First, the most, uh, uh, the, 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 Bubble, I think everyone here knows about, is the house price bubble in 2007. And it's the, 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 uh, some of its de uh, important de uh, determinants is, of course, income growth, because when income grow, also house prices grow. Then we have the level of interest rates and inflation rate, and we all know that uh, they, they uh, determine the, 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 the house price very much because if the, uh, uh, if the uh, interest rate is low, then of course you can pay more for, for the house. So it means a higher uh, house price. And the same with inflation rate. But we also had the growth of, of wealth in the economy determining house prices. And we have two sorts of, basically two sorts of wealth. I'm not speaking about the human wealth now, <laughs> or the human capital, but financial and housing. And, uh, uh, and both of them actually have also had an impact on, on house prices. So now show some of the, the, the graphs. This is now Danish house price and the CPI consumer price uh, from 1971 to 2018. I have always divided here uh, the the scale here in 1983 because it, it's very il illustrative to see what was how what did it look before the deregulation what the, how did it uh, develop after and you can see that house price the blue is, is now house, house price they developed very much in tandem in the first period then house prices started to increase after deregulation but then uh, the government had uh, uh, um, uh, it, uh, introduced a very uh, severe fiscal policy, uh, the Kartoffelkuren, yeah. as you probably all, <laughs> some of you at least uh, will, will remember. That was a very, very harsh uh, policy. And you can see house prices actually went down. And then from approximately from 1995, they started growing enormously. And, and so there are two 
elements here in this graph. It's partly the, the enormous growth of, of house prices. And there you have also the bubble. You can see that you almost can draw the graph like this. And then you have the enormous uh, bubble here that, uh, in a sense, contributed to the financial crisis one year later. If you look at, at the ordinary uh, 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 consumption prices, they have grown with 112% since uh, 83. And house prices has grown with 375% since 1983. So houses have become enormously much more expensive in this period. And I ask try to explain later on why I think all this happened. Uh, what e e economists usually should be a little bit up. Now is it? Yeah. <laughs> economists are, are more interested in, in real values, meaning that you take the nominal price and you did divide by the, con the, the consumption price. And I will, uh, uh, here we have uh, the real. Housing price, it looks very small here now because it is in the same picture as the real stock price. And you can see what has happened <laughs> in this period from 1983. Here they were more or less working together in a tandem way. After 83, real stock prices have increased enormously. This is the financial crisis. Then there were it was, and, and stock prices fell very much, but then uh, the government introduced several bank packet packages, and it didn't take long, and then uh, stock prices were, were, were again uh, up. And here we can see that they have now uh, surpassed the, the, the financial crisis level a lot. And from 1983, to, uh, to uh, 2018, they have grown with 1,088% in real value. Uh, the real uh, GR GDP, BMP in Danish, has, has increased 84%. And uh, the GDP is usually a good measure of say, how much wages and salaries are, are grown in this period. So you can see an enormous difference between how the financial assets have grown and how ordinary people, how the economy, rest of the economy has grown. And we also see that the real uh, uh, house price has grown by 152%. So basically, uh, how the real house prices have grown uh, twice as much as the rest of the economy. <coughs> so how, was, how can we illustrate this? I have taken here a, 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 a table that illustrates exponential growth. And you should now think of 100 kroner in, in 1983. And if that 100 kroner grows with the rate of the GDP, which is a little bit low, uh, below 2%, but let's say now 2%, then it will have doubled in 2018. So if you earned 100 kroners here by going to work, you will probably now get 200 kroners in after 35 years. If you invest uh, uh, 100 kroners in, 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 uh, in stock, in action, then it will have grown to, you will have had an average uh, return of 7%. Uh, exponential growth shows that you then have 1,100 uh, krona after uh, 35 years. And of course, this is an illustration to some extent of why we have this growing inequality, because those who go to work and do not uh, uh, invest the money in, in, in bank uh, stock and, and similar will have not gained a lot, much less than those who had um, 
money to invest at the beginning of the period. One reason for why, say, we have this development has to do with the, the uh, bond rate, that is the long-term 10-year rate, and inflation. You can see this is now the 70s, and in a sense, an illustration of the stagflation period as, as uh, uh, Todd talked about, and why economists became so, so worried, in a sense, because we had, we had high inflation, we had high interest rate, and that means usually also low uh, return on, on financial assets. And of course, the super rich became enormously worried when they experienced this. And, and in, around, say, in the begin, beginning of the 80s, we, we had the general, say, deregulation of capital markets. It came basically from the United States, but, but we saw it all over the, 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 all over the in, industrialized world. And you can see in Denmark, as I said, uh, the, the long-term bond rate was almost 22%. It dropped very, very fast after the deregulation. Then it has continued to go down, and now it is almost close to 0%. Inflation was also very high, say 10 12% in the 70s. It also dropped, and it very quickly dropped to a level of approximately 2%, but then after the crisis, it has been almost 0%. So this is, uh, say, low inflation, low interest rate means, in a sense, that it's very, very uh, uh, cheap to, to, to uh, uh, borrow uh, uh, in the capital markets, and banks have done so enormously and expanded the, the, the loans uh, to the private sector. If you look at the real rates, we can see that you know, the real bond rate increased and has gone down, 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 and then down here. We have the spread between the bond rate and the central bank discount rate. That is also a very important determinant in all these models. And you can see it was a very high level here. It dropped to lower level, and now it's very, very low. And one reason why the, the, these pictures are interesting from, an, from my point of view, because I'm, I'm interested in actually the statistical properties, because the, the standard models will assume that, say, this series would fluctuate around uh, this constant line. And it doesn't. It behaves in, in, in a way which I usually call a non-stationary well. There is a, like a trending behavior in it. And the same is with the spread. You can see it doesn't really move along a one constant line. It, it, it drifts away. And uh, this is one reason why I think the models, that uh, uh, macro models, very often lead to, to, to say, inco uh, incorrect conclusions is that the, one of the basic assumptions underlying the analysis of them is not correct. So they are usually based on uh, assumptions which are much more suitable for a stationary than for a non-stationary world. And, uh, and, the, uh, and there is one particular reason why this is very imp important. And that is that the micro models have become extremely sensitive to the assumption of Ceteris Paribus, everything else equal. And I will have a closer look at this one, because all economic models contain this Ceteris paribus assumption, because usually you choose the most important uh, uh, variables, most relevant variables for the analysis, and then you say, 
let's assume everything else is constant, doesn't really have any impact. But if this everything else, if it is stationary, then probably the conclusions would not be so much uh, uh, influenced by this kind of Catherine's paribus clause. If they are non-stationary, the conclusions can completely change if you include these variables in the analysis. I have done so many, many, many times, and I have found almost always that the conclusions sometimes become completely reversed. So that is one reason. <laughs> and uh, some uh, examples of important non-stationary variables we all had already showed you a picture of the real interest rate and the real and the interest rate spread. They be, behaved in a non-stationary ma manner. But then we have the real exchange rate. And I, after 30 years of hard work, <laughs> I have finally come to the, to the conclusion that the real uh, exchange rate is the most important variable. And that variable is very often a Ceteris Paribus variable in the models. But what, that's, what does that mean, that the real exchange rate is the most uh, in, crucial? I will come to that now, <laughs> yes. Because I will not spend so much, uh, I mean, I could speak for many days probably, <laughs> but, but exactly why the real exchange rate, I think, is so important is very crucial for somehow making sense of everything. So that's why I will spend some time on that now. So it's the importance of, of speculation in the uh, foreign exchange. And, uh, and uh, so most people exchange Danish kronas to dollars and back, not because they are trading goods, but because they speculate that the dollar uh, uh, rate will fall or, or, or rise. And if you ask how much of the, uh, say, transactions in the foreign exchange are due to speculation, I can tell you that, for example, in the dollar euro market, uh, uh, say, the transactions that are based on, on, on uh, say, speculation about, say, expectations about whether they will fall or rise is close to 100%. And if we take the pure speculation that is, which is completely unrelated to anything, any underlying assets, then it's around 75%. But also those, uh, uh, say, transactions which are, have an underlying, uh, uh, say, real asset like a trade, they are also based on, 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 on expectations. And that means that by itself, it, it affects the nominal exchange rate very much. If the speculators are pushing the euro price up, and also then the Danish krona, of course, then it will be more expensive for Danish enterprises to sell their goods in, in, in the United States or in the dollar markets. And that would be OK if the speculators drew the exchange rate to its equilibrium value. And its equilibrium value is such that it is uh, 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 good is uh, cost approximately the same whether it is uh, done as, as I said, produced in Denmark or, or, or if you import it from, say, United States. But this is not what it looked like due to, and that is very much due to self-reinforcing expectations behavior. You believe that the dollar rate is undervalued and you start uh, buying it, and when you buy it, it will actually react in the way you expected, and then the market will follow, and so on. And that is what you find a lot when you analyze, uh, uh, say, this kind of. So when the exchange rate, for example, appreciates over a long period, enterprises have difficulties competing. They have to adjust the price to the international level, or they will lose market shares. So they can keep the prices low. Then, for example, for example 
uh, by uh, changing their productivity, require that workers produce more per hour, firing the least productive ones, introducing new technolo technology, robots, for example, outsourcing production, and to some extent, uh, 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 adjusting profits. So all these uh, above measures tend to cause unemployment to rise, and it uh, can explain the weakening of the labor unions, and to some extent also then the weakening of the polit politicians' <laughs> uh, power. When the exchange rate finally reverses, the pressure on productivity is relieved. But because enterprises now in other countries, say in dollar countries, now experience an appreciation of their foreign exchange rate, they will use similar measures to remain competitive. Now against the, the Danish producers. So it means that prices do not move a lot and we get uh, uh, the persistently low inflation rate uh, we have seen since the deregulation of the capital movements in 1983. And this is a worldwide uh, 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 phenomenon. And the economists have spent so much time trying to explain why inflation rate does not rise. But I think this is, at least according to my research, this is the reason why it stays at, as it stays. I will now show a picture what the real exchange rate looks like. This is now the Danish real dollar rate. And you can see the enormous fluctuations. I mean, in this period, the dollar price was 50% higher than the say, equilibrium would have been. And that, of course, I mean, if you think of enterprises, they resist a, a wage increase of 1% very, very often very, because they say they cannot compete if, you, if wages increase so much. Here we have an increase of a completely different uh, order of magnitude. After uh, joining the euro, then, of course, I mean, it has fluctuate less because then, of course, the, the Danish dollar rate has become the same more or less as the euro dollar rate. But we still have long swings. And these so long swings. This means that in, 80, in 1985, that the dollar was 50% uh, too, too, too expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Overrated. Yeah. And in about 2000, 2003, it was about 30 uh, percent. Yeah, yeah. And in this, I can have some personal experience of it because we were in, in San Diego, had had the research money from from Denmark, and for each month, we had less and less money to live on because, <laughs> because of that. That change in that. so in the end we had only could afford to live in a garage. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's been a lot of discussion in Denmark about one of the three key elements of the EU Act, which is the free movement of labor. Yeah. There's been less talk about the free movement of goods. Yes. And absolutely no talk about the free movement of capital. Yeah. Which is actually expressed here that when you don't have any regulation on the movement yeah. of capital, then the market will take over. Yeah, and uh, one consequence of not understanding that that was the Greek crisis, for example. So it had, I mean, there's so much, in my view, misunderstandings and lack of understanding because people have somehow used the wrong theoretical framework for it for understanding the economy. So in, in my view, I mean, the consequences are really, really very serious very often. I mean, Greek, the Greek economy almost uh, went uh, bankrupt. I mean, that is a serious thing. <laughs> so now we, we, I have tried to explain why we have had this kind of persistently low inflation, less than 2% in several decades. 
And I would say uh, that in, in itself can then explain the low central bank interest rate. So in spite of very house, uh, high housing uh, price and stock price inflation, central bank interest rates have generally been very, very low uh, in this period. And the low central bank interest rates have meant very low loan rate. And one consequence is that the indebtedness of the households have has increased very much, among others, to finance real estate and investment in stock. The low interest rate and the strong increase in financial wealth can explain the strong increase in house prices. So that was the first part. Now, see, I haven't got much time left, but, but I think the the growing inequality is something that many people actually are very, very uh, concerned about. I explained some of the causes, but here is now for Denmark. You can see, I think, uh, wealth in housing, wealth in pensions, and wealth in, in stock, and divided by GDP over the period in order to see how much the wealth has increased more than GDP. If you take uh, uh, housing, we can see that up to 1995, uh, housing per GDP was reasonably developed along a, a constant level. Then it started to increase. We have this bubble here. And altogether, it has increased 70% more than uh, uh, GDP since 1983. If you take the pension wealth, it has actually grown all the period and uh, relative to GDP, and has grown 300% since 1983. If you take the, act, the stock wealth, since 1983, it has grown 1,500%. And of course, in this graph, you uh, can actually see that the, the, the wealth of, of, of stocks were very small in 1983, which partly explains why it has also been able to grow so much. But it's still in an enormous increase. Then uh, many politicians from the uh, Liberal Alliance will say, well, this is fine because it will lead to more in investment, and that will be good for everyone. So here we can have a look at the, the real investment behavior in, in Denmark. So uh, if you look at the, uh, say, real investment in, in, in houses, real investment in buildings and uh, facilities, I think, these are the, 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 the investments in very big, large, uh, 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 large, uh, how, how do you say, well, large facilities. And you can see that they have actually not grown. They have, since the crisis, they have actually declined. If you look at the uh, investment in, in, in housing, and this is now uh, investment, uh, a private investment, it's not in a household. They have grown by 140% since 1983. If you look at the investment in, in the machineries and material, they have grown quite a lot, 562%. But that is robots and they all these things. And it's not completely sure that, say, this increase has benefited ordinary uh, workers. Because it, it, it could also have been just the opposite. So what about the rest of the world? <laughs> because Denmark is. It's a small economy and, and usually follows similar the developments in the rest of the world. So this is now a picture of US uh, stock prices per US GDP. And now the, the, the period is just after the Second World War. And you can see act, the, the stock prices increased a lot because uh, Europe and the rest of the world had to re be rebuilt after the, 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 the war. Then we came to the 70s and it dropped significantly. That was the period with high inflation and high 
uh, interest rate. And it caused the super rich to be extremely concerned, to say the least. And in the beginning of the 80s, Ronald Reagan was uh, then elected as president uh, uh, with the promise of deregulation and tax cuts. And, and, uh, and he was supported by a lot of these super rich uh, uh, lobbyists in that period. Then we can see that it has actually increased. This is partly because of, of its credit finance growth. We can see the IT bubble <laughs> here. It was quite enormous. Then it continued. Here is the financial crisis. It dropped, the stock prices dropped. And then also United States, you had all these packages, bank pack packages to save the banks. And now we are up here at the, same, at the very high level again. So just to make sure that I got you right, the line that you have here on Honda and the lines that you have on the other side as well, that is more or less what the economic, the macroeconomic model that, that is work from. That is approximately what I would say would be a stable. Yeah, that's their reality. <laughs> yeah. And that the red one is that is our, the real reality. That's the imbalances. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I wanted to ask, what you mean by the definition of super rich in, in your terms? Here. Yeah, well, basically the say 1%. Okay, yeah. yeah, the 1% of, 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 of the richest. Yeah. And sometimes it's even 0.01%. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But there is, a, I read a book by the two guys from Yale University, and it's a fantastic book because it's so well documented. And it changed my world view. <laughs> What's the title? Um, the, uh, the, um, the winner takes all uh, uh, politics, I think it is. Hacker and uh, uh, one of, of the authors is, is hacker. I can, I can get you the, uh, the, the, the exact uh, reference. In, in that book, uh, mentioned, uh, you mentioned that. Is that in line with um, the other uh, French uh, economists? Oh, I don't know if uh, it's economists. Uh, Piketty. It, it, uh, they are more uh, uh, political scientists, yeah, okay. and he is economist. Yeah. But of course, I mean, Piketty also uh, has the same ideas. And um, I was compared to Piketty in a Norwegian newspaper, which um, wow. I was very proud of. <laughs> I just, I just looked it up. It's a book that actually is called Winner Take All Politics. Uh, renowned political scientist Jacob S. Hacker and Paul Pearson. Yes, yes, yes. Demonstrate convincingly that the usual suspects, foreign trade and financial globalization, technological changes in the workplace, increased education and job, are largely innocent of the charges and blah, blah. Yeah, That is the book, yes. <laughs> But the effect of all this, you can see on, on the wage uh, development. And this is excess wages in US financial sector. And we start from 19, in the beginning of the 19, here is the, the, the Great Depression in the 30s. And you can see that was the same. Also, capital was deregulated here. Exactly the same uh, development, wages in the financial sector, uh, grow, grew very much more than other wages in other sectors. After the depression, it, it, they fell and it was on a very low level. And here, after Reagan came to power, it started to grow again. And now the, 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 they have continued to grow. This is 2010. And I think the wages in the financial sector is something like 50% higher than similar wages in other sectors. And that has some very enormous com consequences also, <laughs> generally. So this is return on financial stock, means uh, uh, bank action, for example. And you can see, this is in England, but you can see return was reasonably stable with a reasonably small uh, risk up to the 70s when it started increasing. And that is now the effect of 
the, uh, of, of the increase in, uh, in, in, in banks' uh, loan capital. Because they could loan, bank has been able to loan at very low rates in the international market, and they have, have then, of course, give, given they have uh, the ordinary people have also they have expended the the, the loans to, to ordinary people. So here you see that the average rate was 20.4 percent, with a lot of of, of 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 risk because you can see that it varies a lot. But it means, in a sense, that in an economy where that grows with 2%, the, 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 the return on, on bank uh, stock was much, much higher. And then finally, this is the share of the financial sector in U United States uh, uh, G GDP. <laughs> and you can see that it has grown. That was the capital deregulation period. This is the 30s. It dropped, and now it has continued to work. And I think today it is something like uh, it is 11% of, of the US uh, uh, the GDP. And it is probably by now greater than the share of industrial production. So that is an enormous expansion. <laughs> And so in a sense, I think I'm almost, so should I go to the conclusion? Because that, are, that is also the in-depthness, and I think also that is very important. But I could, I could at least uh, show this picture, because um, it, that is something that this is being discussed a lot, the trickle down or the trickle up, because if you listen to what the uh, uh, liberal uh, alliance in tell, say in every political discussion, that is that we should be happy to have deregulation and tax cuts because it will, meet, it will drip down on, 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 on the poorest. And uh, so this is now the unemployment rates for Denmark, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Great Britain, and United States. In the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, in the 2000s, and up now today. Average uh, unemployment rate. And what, what is striking is that unemployment rates are much smaller in the first two decades with capital regulation and, and very high uh, 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 top tax rates all since capital deregulation and tax cuts, unemployment rates have been much higher. So the idea that, that you, know, you, you, you have a policy that somehow is, is best for, for the super rich, and then it will drop, drip down, I think is very hard to reconcile with, with this table. So what should we do? I think we should do build micro models that explain the reality better and uh, fin financial behavior and its effect on the economy must uh, in, in be improved in the models. And I would say <laughs> with confidence that the present models, and I have looked at them in the finance ministry, would not be able to explain what uh, the, the features I showed you in the graphs and in the pictures up to now. So, uh, and I think the financial wealth needs to be more regulated or taxed. I think we should have to avoid a new house price bubble because it's very close to, <laughs> or a new financial bubble. We are essentially at the same level again as it was uh, before uh, the, the big how financial could have, crisis. How could, how could we avoid a new uh, house price bubble? Well, there are uh, ways of, of actually trying to, to to lower house prices, and that is by requiring that the uh, the uh, pay, uh, payment, uh, the the down payment increases instead of so that you do, you cannot take a loan for the whole. For, for, for you should also uh, not re restrict, say the uh, the loans with the no amortizations and and so on, products free loan. 
And then we should focus on green growth rather than on GDP growth, because that is very often completely misleading. It has been a lot, and I think <laughs> just a small advertisement. This is a book I'm, I have been writing, which is about all I, I have talked to her, but now in much more detail and much more explained. <laughs> the uh, economy of Wirklichen, and this will be, I think, read when, when the book will appear in a couple of weeks. <laughs> What's your point of view on the so-called dynamic effects in, in these models? Yeah, the, the dynamic effects. Yeah. And I think it is, that was one reason why I actually started all this discussion, because the way they, they sometimes introduce these dynamical effects, and they are based on evidence which I would say has no scientific uh, uh, foundation at all. And then in other cases, they do know that they allow for, for dynamical effects. So for example, all government expenditure has no dy dynamical effects. So for example, if you improve a uh, daycare <laughs> center, uh, so that the, then there are no d dynamical effects. It doesn't mean that so, uh, some parents now decide to go, to go to work, which previously stayed at home because they were not satisfied with the service and so on. It doesn't, I mean, that, that is, the education has no, no dynamical effects. Uh, tax, uh, uh, lowering the, the, the top cap, uh, tax rates, that has, has actually dynamical effects in the sense that if you lower the tax rate, then people will work so much more. And that means that, as a matter of fact, it doesn't cost anything to, to lower the tax rate. <laughs> I have also analyzed that one. There is absolutely no evidence that this is true. It's just an assumption. So there is a lot to be done. And I, I should be 20 years younger. <laughs> yes. There is a special Danish disease which uh, hits potential finance ministers. Yeah. Which is that they start out by declaring, when they see the potential of the coming finance minister, of harshly criticizing the economic models of the finance ministry. Once they become finance ministers, they stop talking about that. Yeah. Why is that? <laughs> Why is it? Yeah. That's a very good question, because uh, somehow I think <coughs> they have been extremely good at convincing people that these models are, sci scientific, scientific, uh, are scientific in the sense and they are based on very firm uh, evidence. And, I, and that is my, my greatest goal, is to show that this is not the case. And they hate me. <laughs> I can tell <laughs> for that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's a question in line of what you asked. Why don't they get it? I mean, Why do the they? economists in the yeah. Department of Finances, they, you present this so clearly, logically, well-documented, facts on facts on facts yeah. on facts. Why don't they get it? I think it is very close to a religion. <laughs> very close to a religion. Religion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and you do, do not change religion. No, except it's presented as rational. Yeah, but that is uh, just a word. <laughs> In no meaning. <laughs> just a brief comment on that. Maybe the thing is also there's no alternative. So can be criti may maybe they understand part of it and say, yeah, there might be things, but we still don't have an alternative. Yeah. And that will press them into using this yeah. actually useless uh, model anyway. Yeah. And I think to some extent that is true. And to some extent it is because some of the measures we need to do has to do with regulation of, of financial markets. And they are international. And it's not that Denmark, as such, can do very much about it, because you have to go together 
it has to be at least EU, <laughs> but it should be both EU and United States and so on. And then you are, that is very, very difficult. Yeah. But the, the issue of um, taxing the transaction yes. of... Um, Which I think one should do. Absolutely. That is one of my, my suggestions. And of course, there will immediately be so many saying, oh, you know, but that will mean that all capital will leave Denmark and so on. And uh, of course, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Great Britain and in, in uh, Switzerland, they have, they have actually imposed uh, something similar. And nothing has happened. Capital has not left. <laughs> So it, there is a lot also of, of, of say, this kind of uh, scammy company. <laughs> but also the taxing of uh, exchanges would also yeah. hit the Bitcoin, would it not? Yeah. The Bitcoin speculation is for me totally insane. Yeah. And I think even Keynes, I think, originally uh, suggested that one should tax uh, 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 the, the foreign exchange tra transactions in order to stabilize the, the nominal exchange rate. And the Tobin actually was the one. Uh, uh, he, when the Tobin tax that we all uh, speak about was actually a, a tax on, on foreign exchange. So in that sense, even if we all think that it is a tax on, 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 stock, uh, on the stock market, but it was actually, he meant it for, for a foreign exchange in order to stabilize the nominal exchange rate.